morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, hello and good morning. Yeah, you've got a solo grizzly this morning. Even though today's show is supposed to be pre-recorded, unfortunately, it seems that there's a technical glitch with Restream, and all of last week's shows, including the show we recorded on Saturday morning, are gone. I don't know where they went, but they're not there. So Saturday's show, we spent about two hours recording a show Saturday morning, and it has disappeared. The audio files are corrupted, so I can't even use them. So what we had prepared for you today sadly does not exist anymore. So I'm going to try and wing it, which I'm sure I can do. I'm just trying to take care of a couple of things in the background here at the same time. But what I'm going to do is try and give you the show that we did prepare on Saturday, as much as I can from memory, along with some points and some uh, video clips that we have. First things first, let's thank our title sponsors, the Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, CanadianTarot.com, and the Pepper Master, who have been with us since, since before we ever put a show together. They've been with us from the very, very beginning. So thanks again for supporting us. We really do appreciate it and hope you will stick with us as we try and grow this channel and spread our message of honesty and truth. Yes? <laughs> Try and get the true information out there for you every single day and every single way. Well, actually, not every single day, five days a week, sometimes six, but mostly five days a week. We're trying to get the info out to you, the people, so that you understand what is actually taking place in this country from a political standpoint and how we can better address Parliament and our members of Parliament. But to kick off this morning, I have a clip I want to show you from uh, primetime politics regarding the Pharmacare bill that is now law is uh, effective uh, October 11th. And I'm going to share this clip with you. It's my MP, Yasser Nakfi, along with uh, the, uh, oh, his name is escaping me at the moment from the NDP. But I'll show you this clip and then we'll come back to it on the other side in just a few minutes. Here we go. Nakfi is the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Health, Peter Julian, the NDP House leader and health critic for his party. We did invite the Conservatives to join us today, but they declined. Hello to the two of you. Hello, Michael. Good to be with you. And you. Uh, Mr. Nafi, I'll start with you. You know, your, your government has already signed an MOU with British Columbia to make this legislation a reality. But how much longer before we see other provinces signing on as well? Well, first of all, I think it's really important to recognize what a historic moment this is, that the, for the very first time in Canada, we have a, a pharma care legislation that has become law. And a result of that, 3.5 million Canadians will now will have access to diabetic uh, medication and 9 million women will have ac- uh, access to contraceptives. That's a huge step forward in, in the journey of our uh, publicly funded uh, healthcare system. But of course, this is one big step that we have taken. Now the important work begins, as you mentioned in your introduction, which is to work with our provinces and territories to reach agreements uh, with them so that th- these, these medications could be provided to Canadians 
Canadians in those provinces and territories. And that's the important work that we are embarking on uh, now. Uh, we've already have an MOU signed uh, with uh, British Columbia. They are, of course, going through an election right now. So as soon as the election is done, we will resume that work uh, with the government. Um, but we are also studying and engaging in the conversations with other provinces and territories as well so that uh, Canadians can have access to diabetes and contraceptives as quickly as any, possible. Any indication if any province or territory is going to step forward sooner rather than later? Well, that work is, is happening and of course that work is, is uh, taking place in earnest as well. But I think what we have to be mindful of as well, and this is where a uh, little bit of my disappointment comes with, uh, with the NDP. This was important work we did uh, they together and by NDP ripping the, the agreement with the government, and that's their words, not mine, they, they really jeopardized uh, this important work of moving forward <coughs> because we need to make sure that government stays in place uh, till uh, next fall in order for us to finalize these agreements to make sure that Canadians can see the benefit of Pharmacare legislation. Uh, Mr. Julian, I'll get you to answer that. Now, before we go to Mr. Julian, let's, let's remember this for a second. This was part of their supply and confidence agreement, which the Liberals held up their end thereof. But the NDP, as they said, tore it up and walked away. Now, Peter Julian kind of goes on a self-righteous bend here. And I want you to pay attention to what he says, because a lot of it is hogwash. That because, you know, yes, these deals must be signed, because without these deals, if there is a vote before they're actually reached, that does seem to, to suggest that Pharmacare is not safe. Does that mean you're willing to support this government de facto until you see some agreements from the provinces coming around? Well, first off, it's a bit rich given that all the Liberals voted against the uh, Pharmacare bill three and a half years ago in the House of Commons presented by the NDP. The Liberals and Conservatives voted against. And it's uh, Jagmeet Singh and the NDP that brought the Liberals finally to acknowledge the Pharmacare Act that you'll recall, Michael, that uh, last spring I had to, as House Leader, basically uh, stop uh, the parliamentary work because the Liberals weren't agreeing to Pharmacare. And the fact that this is now a reality of the law of the land, I think, is, is vitally important, but it wouldn't have come without the NDP. I mean, the Liberals have always promised and never delivered. The NDP, Jagmeet Singh, and the NDP caucus delivered. Now, the reality is uh, we're talking about a situation that is life-saving. There are hundreds of people that die every year because they can't afford to pay for their diabetes medication and devices. That's according to the CFNU. So the reality is we need to sign these agreements immediately because it's saving lives and making sure that people who have diabetes aren't subject to this burden of finding $1,000 or $1,500 every month just to keep themselves in, um, healthy and alive. Now, I do have a question for you. I've heard that number bandied about never, uh, a number of times in the United States of America, but I've never heard about people in Canada paying that much for insulin. If anybody can let me know in the chat if that's the case, that $700 to $1,500 a month for insulin, I've never heard it cost that much. Not in Canada. Now, maybe I'm ill-informed. That's possible, entirely probable, but I don't believe that's the case here. I think he's pulling American numbers and throwing, the, throwing them into the conversation to make it look like the NDP has done something bigger than they ever have. But let's not forget who defeated child care a number of years ago. That was Jack Layton when he was head of the NDP, when he was the, when he was the party leader, who voted with uh, the conservative, Stephen Harper, against child care because Harper said, do this and I'll do that for you, which we get it. Politics is always compromise and negotiation, but my goodness, don't give me the holier-than-now attitude when you really aren't. And if they don't, if they can't afford their medication, they end up in the hospital, which means there's a huge cost to our acute care system, which is why the NDP pushed so hard on this. Uh, there, it's a no-brainer. There are a number of provinces that have indicated, as you mentioned, BC, Manitoba, Newfoundland, and Labrador, the, the number of provinces that are willing to step up immediately. And as the NDP succeeded when we brought in universal health care 60 years ago, it took a couple of... Wasn't that social credit or the CCF? Either way, same party in the end which is fine because yes it's important and i'm very thankful that we have universal health care in this country of years for conservative provinces to sign on because often uh, they were opposed on ideological grounds and what happened to those conservative provinces is that either the government changed its mind or the people of that province changed the government okay and, okay and that's but... why pharmacare will be rolled out 
but the Liberal government has to take it seriously and negotiate immediately to put in place okay, these but, agreements. Okay, but, but, but what you're saying there, there, Peter, that ultimately it did take some time. So are, does that mean you will give this Liberal government more time to get these deals signed and, and meanwhile support them in confidence motions? Or is that something you're, no, you as no, a party no, still debating? No, no, these are two different issues. We're, no, these are two different issues. We, we've said we're proceeding vote by vote in terms of the House. We did that during COVID, and as a result of that, Canadians benefited from more supports to families, small businesses, seniors, people with disabilities, students, and of course, uh, workers got their first paid sick leave in Canadian history, all because of the NDP intervening vote by vote. As I'm sorry, workers got their first paid sick leave in history? I don't know where he came up with that. Now... I did have three paid sick days, which is not much, admittedly, but uh, yeah, I think he's reaching for that one a little bit. And also, here's the thing, if we got our first paid sick days in history, how many did we get and do I get more and when do I get them? <gasps> right, right, that is not the case. He's stretching that one a lot. Who did get paid sick days? Anybody who uh, does work for the federal government. Wait, didn't they already have that? I'm not sure. There was some new bill tabled and legislation brought forth where they were able to give uh, support workers who work for um, federal public servants, they're not necessarily federal public servants, but do work for the federal government across the country. Uh, they were able to get some sick leave, but that was it. And yes, sick days tend to be provincial unless they're as a federal employee, but that's different too. And, it, and it's uh, also... Uh, employer basis. Private sector doesn't want to pay you any sick days. They actually don't want to pay you at all. They want to work for free, but that's another story altogether. <laughs> As far as Pharmacare is concerned, those agreements can be signed in a matter of weeks. And, and we are saying, and Jagmeet Singh said this morning very clearly to the Prime Minister, Liberals have to take this seriously. They will sign the agreements. There will be, I expect, uh, one or two holdouts purely on ideological grounds. But the reality is most Canadians will be benefiting from Pharmacare within a matter of weeks if the Liberals take this seriously and those negotiations are completed with the provinces. Okay. Now, we did hear uh, Pierre Polyev this morning, uh, Mr. Nakhti. He, he says that most people are already covered by private drug plans. Not everyone needs a publicly funded program. So why did this happen? Well, we all know that's a big pile of uh, shit. Most people do not have private plans. Many people do, but this program will ensure, provide pharma, pharmacological products to uh, 7.5 million Canadians who are uninsured and underinsured. Technically speaking, with my last position, I was underinsured with the new bigger company than I was with a smaller company. When I worked for company A and there were 15, or, uh, 75 of us, we had a very extensive drug program. It was a really good program. Cost me less than the big company's program did and provided me more. One of the medications I require from time to time to treat rosacea is ivermectin. Yeah, ivermectin. It's a cream you put it on your face. Well, there's only one company in the world that makes it because they own the patent and it's not, there's no generic version thereof. When I worked for company A before we got bought up by the bigger company B with 1,500 employees, that was covered. Under company B, they're like, oh no, we only cover generic versions. I'm like, but there is no generic version. Well, you can, can pay for it up front and then go fight to get, I'm like, it's $250 a tube, a tiny tube. So I was underinsured with a bigger company with larger buying power and more employees. But that was the case. And it made me wonder, would I qualify for this new program? I'm sure I would now because I have nothing. So let's see how it goes. Have to be universal rather than income adjusted like dental care. After, you know, right now your government has a $40 billion deficit on its hands. Why not make it more targeted rather than universal? 
Well, these are life-saving uh, medications uh, when it comes to uh, supporting uh, people who live with diabetes or ensuring that 9 million women and gender diverse people in Canada have access uh, to contraceptives. I, we think that this should be available uh, to all Canadians. It actually will save them a lot of money as well, uh, which is very important in this moment when there is an, an affordability uh, crisis. We also know that Pierre Polyev and his conserv uh, conservatives don't support public health care. That's why they voted against this legislation as well. And I think that's what at stake uh, also, because if if Pierre Polyev uh, is successful somehow, he will scrap uh, farmer care. So, so I do uh, think that that both liberals and NDP who supported farmer care in their respective platforms found common ground. They worked together in the best interests of Canadians. That is a good thing. And now the NDP walking away from it, siding with Pierre Polyev just to score some political po points, it undermines the progress we have made. Of course, we will work with all seriousness as we have been working up to now to get this legislation done uh, by uh, by working with provinces and and territories and get the deals signed Thank but it still jeopardizes this is this whole thing and it's only going to hurt Canadians and no one else but we will keep working hard to make sure that Canadians get the farmer care they deserve okay so I thought that was uh, well said honestly and as uh, PNC bios pointed out here I'll put it in the in the chat in the uh, on the screen 7.5 million is less than half of 40 million most Canadians do have insurance then just by the math yes correct but the seven and a half million Canadians those are the ones who are signing up for the program not everybody signed up for it hi uh, so I think the number is bigger than most people realize you have to remember there's a lot of people who work for companies that in you know uh, big big box retailers for grocery and department stores, if you will, who employ a uh, vast swath of their population of employees, they get less than 40 hours a week, which means they're not full time, which means they do not get any benefits whatsoever. There are millions of people like that. I would like to table legislation or have legislation tabled, I would say, should say, where y y you can no, no longer do that. They're like, well, we hired, you know, we, we hired... We can hire 20 people at 30 hours a week versus 10 at 40. Well, that's not even true. You could staff your stores correctly because anybody who's gone into any one of those big box retailers, no, you can never find somebody to give you help when you need it. They run them on less than skeleton crews because that's overhead. I could go on a diatribe about this for hours. I'm not going to, but I like Yasser. He's a good MP. He's my MP. I don't know the man personally, but I would like to invite him on the show to come in and talk about this a little bit more and in depth. And I'd even invite Mr. Julian to, to come and chat with us as well and address some of the things that we'd like to talk to about him. If they happen to catch this show and want to join us for a little bit, you're more than welcome to join us at any time. We would love to have a conversation with you. Yeah, there you go. There you go from Linda. Even the, their country library system. So Linda lives out in the country. She says the library system offers benefits, but then schedule most of their employees at less than 40 hours a week. This is super common. So underinsured, absolutely. At less than 40 hours a week at the big box retailer stores that used to be many of them unionized. And, you know, Galen Weston used to have mostly unionized stores. But, hey, I need to have another billion on top of my yacht. The have-nots and the have-yachts, guess, guess which category I fit into. I bet you I can't. I bet you can't. Yes. That, that's, I'm being sarcastic, just in case you didn't notice that. <laughs> so let's talk about a couple of different things here. Um, we're going to move it on a little bit from off the political topic, and, and, and let's go into a full Thanksgiving mode, actually, today. Uh, Maggie McNeil has retired from competitive swimming. I guess she just decided, all right, I've had enough. Uh, like an exceptional uh, athlete, an exceptional young Canadian, somebody who has helped bring to light um, mental health issues, even at the hyper-competitive Olympic level. And let me just pull up her file here. Whoops. It helps if I actually type her name correctly, I find. Maggie McNeil, oh, there she is. Yes, so Maggie McNeil, uh, where is the story? Come on, she just stepped down from competitive swimming. Uh, let me, I'm sorry about this. Uh, 
There we go. Here's the story. I'll just read this to you now. Canadian Olympic swimming champion Maggie McNeil is retiring. The gold medalist in the women's 100-meter butterfly at Tokyo's uh, Summer Olympics. Yeah, Summer Olympic Games in 2021 announced the move on social media Thursday in a post. And this stupid thing keeps putting pop-ups on my screen. I know what I'll do. I will see if I can find the Torstar version of this because I have a Torstar subscription. And we'll just eliminate that and we'll go to Toronto Star. There we go. And let's see if I can find the thing on Maggie McNeil retirement story here. I, I had it and all of this stuff we just suddenly lost because I don't know, there's some big tech glitch over the last couple of days. And can't even have a search function for it. Why is it not why is it not giving me the search function? This is truly bizarre. Oh, there it is. Maggie McNeil. Why did they, they didn't even have a, wow. They don't even have a story regarding it. <laughs> Way to go, Toronto Star. National Post covered it, but the tour star didn't. Maggie McNeil retirement. Where did it go? Here we go. All right, here's the story from the CBC. <sighs> Maggie, Maggie McNeil re announces retirement at 24. Three-time Olympic medalist and world record holder won 100-meter butterfly gold in Tokyo. She said, uh, anyone who I cross paths with never, ever told me I couldn't achieve my goal of going to the Olympics. It's still surreal to be able to say I'm a two-times Olympian. I've always wondered what the woman would feel like when I decide to hang up the cap and goggles. Well, here it is. I am officially retired from competitive swimming. The little girl above, there's a photo of her, and I'll show you that in a moment, would have never dreamed this is where her love of swimming would take her. I'll keep it brief, but I am so grateful for all the memories, people, and places I've gotten to experience just through swimming. Anyone who I cross paths with never ever told me I couldn't achieve my goal of going to the Olympics. Still surreal to say I'm a two-time Olympian. I'm excited to begin the next chapter of my life journey as I embark on discovering who I am outside of swimming with love and gratitude for the years of endless support. I'm going to show you this photo because it's quite adorable. This is her from uh, directly from her Instagram uh, account. Here we go. I'll put it on the screen. There she is. <laughs> Look at how cute that is. And there's more of Maggie with her Olympic gold medal and the swim team. And yeah, I think that's pretty awesome. So, yeah, she's uh, decided to, like I said, hang up the cap and goggles after uh, a long and illustrious career. I mean, my goodness gracious. Two-time Olympian, multiple medal winner, gold medal winner. And she says, I, I, I know I'm not going another quad for the Olympic cycle. I've never wanted to compete to 2028. She told CBC Sports last February. I've accomplished more than I ever wanted in swimming. And by doing that, I would be happy if I retired now. Two months later at the Canadian Open of Toronto, she said she wasn't leaving competitive swimming anytime soon. I'm definitely not done with the sport after the, Paralympi after the Paris Olympics. She told CBC Sports, our friend Devin Aru, I do have ambitions outside the pool. I w in February, I was more talking about how I was excited to move on with that once my career has finally come to an end. So I think she was on the fence about it a little bit and then made her decision recently. Rick Bishop, LSU head swimming coach, said McNeil's retirement will leave a big hole in the Canadian national te uh, team program. You're talking about someone who, who you could count on year in, year out, he told CBC Sports earlier this year. She's been invaluable on relays from a butterfly and freestyle perspective. So two-time Olympian, uh, best female athlete at the Tokyo Games in 2021 after winning her signature event, the 100-meter butterfly, and adding silver in the 4x100-meter freestyle relay and bronze in the 4x100-meter relay. In July, she placed fifth in her Olympic title defense in Paris. She delivered one of the fastest opening 50 meters of her career, but that drained her tank in a furious rush for the wall. Tori Husky knocked off world record holder Gretchen Walsh for gold, 55.59 seconds to 55.63, using a strong finish to get her hands to the wall just ahead of her teammate in a 1-2 finish for the U.S. It's hard enough to do it once, and to do it again is even harder, McNeil told the Canadian press after the race. The last couple of months, I've been really telling myself that I have nothing to prove to anyone, myself or anyone else. She's right about that. Her time of 56.44 was 23 one hundredths of a second off Zhang Yufi's bronze-worthy performance. McNeil was fourth in the 4 by 100 meter freestyle relay final with Summer McIntosh, Taylor Ruck, and Penny Alexiak. 
2.69 seconds after third place China, also in Paris. McNeil was fourth in the women's medley relay, fifth in mixed medley relay, and 16th in women's 100-meter free. She holds the short course world records in the 50-meter backstroke and 100-meter butterfly, which she set in 2022 while retaining her world titles in Melbourne. She captured eight gold medals at the short course world championships in two years. Her collection of 19 career world championships medals also includes the 2019 long course world title in the 100 meter butterfly. She won seven career medals at the Pan Am Games with five of the golden variety last year in Santiago, Chile. She also took home the Commonwealth Games title in the 100 meter butterfly as part of a five medal haul at the 2022 edition in Birmingham, England. She's won the world championships, broken two world records, held an NCAA record at one time, Olympic gold, world championship gold, Pan Ams, you name it, she's won it. Born in Zhujiang, China, and adopted by Susan, Dr. Susan McNair and Dr. Edward McNeil at age one, McNeil started swimming when she was two. Her mother wanted her to take swimming lessons for safety reasons because of the family's backyard pool. McNeil's 2017 diagnosis of sport-induced asthma, which can be triggered by the swimming staples of heat and chlorine, forced a switch from longer distances to sprints. She became Canada's first, first world champion of the women's 100-meter butterfly two years later. She swam collegiately for three years at the University of Michigan under Bishop, winning a pair of NCAA titles before reuniting with him at LSU. McNeil camped her college swimming career by setting the NCAA record in the 50-yard freestyle at the 2023 NCAA championships. 50 yards? I thought it was meters. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, a long and illustrious career career from uh, the wonderful Maggie McNeil has been uh, quite something. She's had a she's had a heck of a run, and we hats off full 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 respect, Maggie. Thank you for representing our country on the world stage in such dramatic and grand fashion. I don't think there's any other way to uh, any other any more to say about that. I mean, she's stepping away at the absolute top of her game. And that's got to be something to respect. And at 25, I mean, she might get into coaching, commenting. Oh, who knows? Either way, I think her future is quite bright. I think she's going to be okay. In other news, and let me see if I can find the story. I did have it here a moment ago. Um, time 100. There we go. I have it. Okay, so... Time 100, uh, Summer McIntosh is, has been uh, shortlisted for the Time 100, and this uh, was posted just a few days ago, October 2nd, and written by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. So I'll show you the article in a sec here, and there's a, there's a great photo of Summer. The, the, uh, hang on, let me just shrink it down so it'll fit on the screen here. Here is the photograph I will share with you of Summer, and then I will read you the story in case you haven't already heard it. So there's Summer uh, with that million-dollar, 100-watt uh, smile. And in the, this is an article written uh, for Time magazine as a submission to uh, have Summer be part of the Time 100, the 100, Time 100 Next for 2024. Written by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Summer McIntosh's parents used to heat up their backyard pool so she could swim during the cold Canadian winters. A decade later... Their daughter is a superstar at age 18 and still warming up. As one of Canada's star athletes in Paris, Summer won four gold medals and became the only Canadian athlete to win three golds in a simple single Olympic Games. Her performances in the pool were remarkable as she brought our nation to its feet and inspired the new generation of Canadian swimmers to dream big. Summer and all of Team Canada made us proud as we continue to celebrate their hard work, dedication, and sporting excellence. It truly was the summer of summer. And while she's come a long way from taking laps in her family pool to reaching the top of the Olympic podium, Summer McIntosh's story is truly just getting started. And when you consider the fact that she is, you know, 18, just turned 18, I think her future is bright. Like, my goodness gracious, what, what an athlete. What a, what a great young Canadian to represent her country on the world stage. Yes, PNC bio. Going back to a statement earlier about uh, population base. 7.5 million is 18% of the population that is un uninsured or underinsured that we know about. Not everybody is registered for the program yet. So 
I think as time marches on and more and more people register for the PharmaCare program, we'll see that it is a, a larger number than we are aware of because I, I, I'm pretty sure it's a little bit higher than that. Um, I'm, I'm, I would say it's probably closer to 30% of the population that doesn't have any sort of plan. I know anybody who works in the service industry or the retail industry probably have no mental, dedical, oh, mental, oh boy, try that again, medical plan as in pharmacy, or pharma care, any sort of drug plan or dental care or optical care. So the dental, national dental program and the national pharma care program, along with the, the child $10 a day daycare program is going to lift a lot of people out of poverty. Because let's face it, when you need to get a $280 prescription or a $250 prescription and, and, and you're facing, am I going to pay my hydro bill this month? Which reminds me, I have to pay my hydro bill this month. Am I going to pay my hydro bill? Am I going to be able to pay my rent? Do I eat for the next few days? These are real concerns for millions of Canadians. So this program, PharmaCare, along with dental care and $10 a day daycare, is going to change a lot of lives. Now, if we can get a UBI in there, and the difference that would make. And it's going to come sooner than you think. And here's why I say this. UBI is going to have to come sooner than you think. Because I've talked about this before, about how automation and AI are changing the game right now. Well, I heard a podcast the other day. It was about 35 minutes. And the podcast hosts, they were two AIs, a male and a female male voice, female voice, AI, were given a topic to discuss. And it was an entire page, so like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of page. And from top to bottom, all was written was fart, 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 shit, 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 fart, 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 fart. That was the entire topic they were asked to discuss. And I listened to this podcast, it was about 35 minutes, I think. And it was actually fascinating because they found ways to talk around the subject matter. It was really impressive. So that means this newfound uh, career of mine that I'm trying to commit to as uh, doing book narration, voiceover work, ads, podcasts, how soon before that disappears to AI? I have programmer friends who told me that in five years their jobs won't exist because AI will just write code. And we still don't have a UBI. That was defeated last week. Okay, I'm going to get off that uh, platform, if you will, my high horse, my soapbox, and I want to show you a video uh, regarding Christine Sinclair's retirement. Her announce, she announced her retirement at the end of the 2024 season. And here we go. This is Christine Sinclair's uh, retirement announcement video. And it's uh, might make you a little emotional. When I heard that there was going to be a team in Portland, my decision was made. And it's where I knew I wanted to play the rest of my career. Obviously, I, I had no idea how successful we would be as a, as a team and as an organization, but just to be a part of this and to continue to be a part of the growth of the league. We were there from the beginning and set the bar from the beginning and continue to do that. Clever inside the 18, and there it is! Sinclair was not to be denied. I think it's the first goal I've ever scored here. So it was nice to get the goose egg off the back. It's Sinclair for the hat trick! It is raining goals here in the Pacific Northwest. Christine Sinclair trying to put it away. Sinclair scores! Christine Sinclair giving Portland a 2-0 advantage, and that just might seal the first National Women's Soccer League title. Sinclair chipped and scored! Regular season goal number 51 might be the most impressive of all. The Portland Thorns win the end of the Zell Championship! you guys. It's been an incredible ride, and uh, let's go get that third star. Christine Sinclair looking. Shoot it! Go! Portland wins it! When I'm done playing, I'll know I've, I've given, like, absolutely everything to the sport, and 
reached my absolute full potential. This night belonged to the Thorns as Portland once again rise to the top of the National Women's Soccer League, winning their record third NWSL championship. For me, I'm just proud that I've been able to call Portland my home throughout the entire journey and see the growth of the league, see the growth of this club, um, and then worldwide, see the growth of women's soccer. Sink. Sinclair, Christine Sinclair, the uh, greatest goal scorer in international football or international soccer, whichever you'd like to address. Nobody has scored more goals internationally than she has. No one, male or female, period. Uh, to address this uh, PNC bio, uh, 30% is still less than half. Your previous statement was just incorrect. No problem. I'm, I'm fine with that. I, you know, I, I, like I said, I believe the number to be higher than is reported because not all the information is in. But that, that's fine. I, I don't have a problem with being wrong. I just want to make sure that, you know, we get factually correct information out there. And 30% is still a large swath of the population that is uninsured or underinsured. And I think there's probably more underinsured than uninsured. But I could be wrong. But time will tell. That's a good question, Linda. Maybe Christine Sinclair could come on board and give Soccer Canada back some dignity. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Something tells me, though, she probably won't do that. Uh, I'm just guessing she might work with the NWSL, National Women's Soccer League, to, to a degree. Uh, work as a commentator, I think. But I could be wrong. You know, maybe she's got something else in the pipeline. She you know, did go to university. I don't, know what her, I don't know what her educational background is, to be honest with you. But she did study university. She did get her degree. And I don't know what it's in. And I, I'll see if I can find it now. Christine Sinclair... Let's see here. What have we got? Where did she go to school? She's from Burnaby, BC, and just uh, uh, she turned 41 this past uh, June 12th. Played 20 seasons with the senior national team. And what was her alma mater? Uh, don't see it here. No, it does not give. I don't have her alma mater. She played for the Portland Pilots uh, senior career, Vancouver UBC alumni. So she went to UBC, FC Gold Pride, Western New York Flash, 2013 to now Portland Thorns. That's her international career, U21, U19. And for Canada, from 2000 to 2023, she played in 331 uh, appearances, 331 appearances. And... Uh, 190 goals internationally. I think, yeah, 190 goals in 331 matches ranks her in the most career international play for anybody who's ever strapped on the boots and got on the pitch. So she also studied at the University of uh, Portland where she uh, played for the team, making them the uh, NCAA Division I uh, title, titleist, I guess. I can't. I don't know what her her uh, her degree is in. It doesn't seem to say here, but that that's fine. I don't need to know everything. I don't think I said more than half the country is uninsured. I think I no. I I don't think I said half more than half the country. If I did, I apologize. But uh, either way, there's a lot of uninsured people and. Insuring 10 million Canadians, yes. Giving 10 million Canadians a pharmacare program is, 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 I think, an important step forward in making uh, the playing field a little bit more on the level side of things, if you will, for, you know, like I said, it, rising tide lifts all boats. So let's lift those boats. And uh, I guess we could announce it, It's if you, in case you didn't notice. Uh, former disgraced comedian uh, Mike Bullard died over the weekend, apparently of a heart attack. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. That's I don't need to dig into it. Uh, I think that's been, been, been beaten to death, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I don't... I think all the commentary that it needs to be made about that has been made. I'm just going to announce that he passed away over the course of the weekend, apparently of a heart attack at age 67, and that's it. He had a long career, and then he torpedoed himself through bad behavior and harassment. And Cynthia Mulligan, a reporter with, I believe it's City Pulse or City News, 
uh, was the one who was the target of his harassment. You can read all about it if you want to search it out. I'm not going to go digging for that right now because I really don't want to, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm in a good mood and I like to stay that way. And if I start reading about bad people doing bad things, it will upset me. And after all, this is Thanksgiving Monday and I am thankful. I'm thankful that I have this Monday morning, that I was able to wake up and get up and do this for you. I'm grateful. Admittedly, my mental health has taken a bit of a beating over the last number of days, and I think that largely has to do with the fact that, well, studies recently have shown that if you have one sleepless night, it takes about four days for your body to recover from it. And when my uh, fatigue gets to be extreme, so does my anxiety and depression, even with medication. So that explains an awful lot about where my head's been the last few days. I am feeling better today, although I didn't have a great night's sleep last night. I am feeling better today. How's everybody in the uh, chat feeling this morning? I know it's uh, a smaller crowd than normal, but it is a holiday, so I expect some people are just sleeping in, which, hey, I get it. <laughs> no problem. Also, when, you know, if you read the thing, it says it's pre recorded. This is actually live today, uh, only because, like I said, the pre recorded content we had arranged uh, is gone. I do not know what happened to it. It's gone. All of last week's shows are gone. So I have to re-record, which is easy enough to do from the, the YouTube feed, the Thursday and Friday show uh, for the audio only version, because I've already got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays uh, set up and posted. So yeah, there we go. I kind of, I kind of think that's it, to be honest with you. If there's anybody who wants to add into the chat what they are thankful for today, and if you're going to be having it, I don't know if you had your Thanksgiving dinner yesterday or if you're going to be having it today. I plan to have some turkey later on today at some point in time. We'll see how that works out schedule wise. I do have a lot of recording to do today and narration to get done. So we'll see how that works out for me. I'm, I'm not sure if I'll get everything done. I did see some cringeworthy rap this weekend that I'm not even going to give respect to because. <laughs> Oh, and one other story I guess we should comment on, or I should comment on, is the story coming from Althea Raj. Was it Althea Raj? Dozens of liberals to, set to demand Trudeau step down. Sources. Well, apparently that's since been debunked that there's dozens of them by the Globe and Mail. From what I understand, uh, there might have been two. Two MPs in caucus, not dozens. So... um yeah. Makes me lose a little bit of respect for all theorage in that respect because, um, ma'am, you, you're known for actually writing good articles, but this is, this is an opinion piece, not your usual rabble rousers inside the growing calls among MPs for Justin Trudeau to step down. Uh, this, like I said, has since become a different story, as according to the Globe and Mail, uh, that's not nearly the number. They, they spoke to a number, and, and uh, apparently that's not the case. So I'm, I'm beginning to wonder, what is going on here? Again, this is an opinion piece. So why is an opinion piece being stated as news? It says right in the headline. Let me show it to you. It says opinion, which means that's open to interpretation. Opinion. It's from October 11th, which was Friday, wasn't it? Yeah, Friday. Friday at 6.32 p.m. So, yeah. I believe it has since been um, debunked. Let's see if I can find the article in the Globe and Mail. Mm. Some liberal MPs launched new plush. Trying to find the article. Some liberal MPs launched new push to oust Trudeau. Yeah, that's not it. I don't know where the article went. Oh, well. Either way, it is out there. It is online. You can find it out if you so seek to do so. Let me see if I can uh, find it here on another feed. Uh, 
apologies for the silence while I type, trying to keep the keyboard quiet. Uh, I do not, I do not see it here. I did read about it the other day, and I, I don't think I bookmarked it, so no, I can't seem to find it. Alas, I do not know where it went. My apologies, folks. I'm trying to stay on top of things sometimes it's difficult. Uh, yeah, I don't know where the story went. I did have it. It was a Globe and Mail article uh, talking about how it has since been debunked that there were not more than half or half or several dozen. It was a total of two, apparently. So how does two become several dozen or a dozen? Or a I don't know. It's a lot of speculation in there, if you ask me. So today actually is Thanksgiving Monday, and most people tend to have their turkey dinner on Sunday. I will be having one later today, and I hope wherever you are in this country, this beautiful nation of ours, that you get to have a dinner too, whether it be Thanksgiving or otherwise. <laughs> Not everybody likes to celebrate Thanksgiving because colonization, you know, that, that old chestnut. And I'm not making light of call off. I'm not making light of that, okay? I'm just... I happen to like Thanksgiving. If you don't and you don't want to celebrate it, that's fine. It's free country, man. Do whatever you want. Just don't hurt anybody in the process, and we're fine. Okay, I am going to put a bow on that for today, because I really was prepared to, to, to have our show that we had recorded on Saturday play this morning, but like I said, it's it's gone. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Things, stuff, technology. Restream has been behaving strangely the last few days, so maybe that's got something to do with it. I don't know. Either way, thanks for coming out. We do appreciate you. We do have, like I said, and we've all told you many times before, we do have QR codes you can scan over here is our coffee page where you can get to that. And if you want to do that, you can donate there. And I will put that on the bottom ticker here where it will scroll. And what you see below my chin is the True North Eager Beaver Media Pod page sponsored by the Ray Girl. You can go to um, podpage.com forward slash the True North Eager Beaver with a hyphen between each word. And you will find all of our content there. And as soon as it gets released, it goes there immediately. You can go to coffee, ko-fi.com forward slash eager beaver if you wish to donate. Or you can scan the QR codes that are on the screen if you are watching this right now. Thanks for coming out, folks. We do appreciate each and every one of you. And as difficult as some days can be, I, like I said, am thankful. I'm thankful to be here with you this morning. I'm thankful that we have this platform where we can exchange ideas and bounce different things off of one another, where we can reach out and ask for information and sometimes help if that need be. One of the things I think millions of Canadians are thankful for today is the new PharmaCare program, which will help a lot of people who could otherwise be suffering horribly. Free contraception at the till and uh, free diabetes medication to start. They're starting small and growing from there. And yes, we pay for it with our taxes, but it means that when you go to the, the pharmacy, you don't pull out your wallet. You pull out your OHIP card. That was a little jab at Doug Ford in case you didn't pick up on that. If anybody is interested this evening, I will be doing a, an ASMR show. I'll put the link on the screen right now. It's, uh, let me just see here. I thought I had it down here. Maybe I don't. I will put the QR code up there, and I will put this in the ticker so you can see it. Whoops, clicked the wrong button there. And do I have it? No, let me just put this right here. I will scroll this along the bottom. It's, it's quite a bit if you're looking for it. And let's see if I can find it properly here so that you can go in and check it out at any time. And by all means, please pop in. Say hello. Here it is. There we go. That's what I wanted. And uh, it's, uh, that's not it. There we go. Need to correct things sometimes, you know. 
there we go. So if you go to uh, this channel right here on YouTube, uh, youtube.com forward slash at Polly's World 2005, you will find my personal ASMR YouTube channel where you can join us for an ASMR mental health chat. And I will be on this evening at 9 p.m. to talk to you about where my head is at and how I can make it better, hopefully. Hopefully. Thankfully. Thanksgiving, thankfully. Bit of a reach there, I guess. All right. You uh, take care. We will talk to you soon. Bye. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. Something we forgot to address on Friday. Uh, apparently, and I'm just learning this now, so that's probably why we forgot to address uh, Apparently, Friday was National Coming Out Day. So, uh, wow, there we go. Didn't know that. Something to, to share with your friends, let you know Friday was National Coming Out Day. So, there we go. All right, I'm going to boogie on out of here because I've got some other recording to do. And again, apologies that uh, the show uh, was not what we had intended to provide to you. Technology just failed miserably. So, you take care, and I'll give you these words of wisdom. Reach out. Reach out to those you care about, especially on this day of days. Bye. <laughs>